Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for our Ask an Angler, uh, talking about bank fitting for sunfish here in the state. So we'll start off, we'll just talk a little bit about the sunfish species in the state, um, what you're looking for when you go fishing, and uh, what are going to be kind of your top baits and lures that you're going to use to target the fish. Uh, sun fishing here in Oklahoma is typically at its best during, you know, mid spring all the way into the early summer. And then you're going to catch sunfish throughout the summer, especially in smaller bodies of water. Um, our sunfish here in the state, most of the species that most anglers come into contact with are going to be your bluegill, your green sunfish, and your red ear sunfish. As we move in kind of the eastern half of the state, especially in the Clearwater creeks and rivers, you're going to find an abundance of other types of sunfish, uh, primarily like long ear sunfish, pumpkin seed sunfish, but there's a handful of sunfish species that are out there. But the three dominant ones that are going to exist in our lakes and ponds where most people come into contact with these fish, they're going to be your bluegills, um, red ears, and your green sunfish, and then the hybrids of those species. So Sunfish, unlike our bass species or our crappie species, which tend to uh, spawn at either different times, different depths, different habitats, where there's less likely to be natural hybridization during their spawning period, sunfish will gather in great numbers in very similar habitat, especially in confined bodies of water like a small lake, city lake, um, farm pond, city pond you're going to see a lot of crossover. So you're going to see natural hybrids. Now, the Department of Wildlife, one of the fish that we stock pretty prevalently throughout the state, especially in the smaller bodies of water, is a hybrid, which is a blue, uh, bluegill mixed with the green sunfish. And the reason for that is green sunfish, unlike all of the other sunfish species, well, green sunfish um, have kind of smaller weights, total potential for growth, they have the largest mouth on them of the sunfish species, where most of even a big one and a half, two pound red ear or bluegill is going to have a mouth that's something like this when it goes fully open. A green sunfish that is a quarter of that size will have a mouth that's about that. And they are just voracious feeders. They tend to inhabit shallow water. They're aggressive for longer periods of time. So we cross them where we can attain greater weights with the bluegill genetics and then we get um, kind of the, the big bite veracity of the green sunfish as well as a little bit bigger mouth on those hybrids. So they can take a little bit bigger bait, bigger hook sizes, and they just become easier to catch. So today we're just going to go through all of the, the different elements of sunfishing, which is coming into kind of its prime right now for bank anglers. They are not really a deep water fish. But when you get into bigger reservoirs, deep water is relative. They might be out in eight, 10 feet of water on some structure that you can't cast to six, eight months of the year. Now they're going to push out of that very quickly and they're going to start getting up into that shallow cover habitat, back of coves, very easy, accessible water for bank anglers. And that's when you can really load up a stringer. There's no uh, limit on sunfish in the state. So you can, you know... You can go after a ton of them and load up a stringer just like you would crappie. And they are, of all the species, probably the most easy species to catch for about six months of the year. No matter where you're fishing, worm in a bobber or small artificial lures and flies, you're going to have a lot of success stacking up big numbers of fish. And we're coming into that time of year where you really have an opportunity from the bank to target some of the larger fish, fish that are going to range in kind of the pound to two pound range. With sunfish, we typically are talking inches as opposed to weight. So most of your sunfish are going to run in the four to eight inch realm. Uh, but this is the time of year where you can really get into numbers of fish in the eight to 12 inches which are great for cleaning. Um, they're going to clean just like a crappie. And in some instances, they're going to have a lot more meat on them. They start to develop those shoulders on them once they hit about a pound. So that filet that comes back through their body is a lot more heavy set. Um, and unlike crappie, they put up much more of a fight. So people who are looking out maybe not to catch and keep, but just to catch and play fish, even the smaller half pound sunfish on light action tackle are going to give a much better fight than a crappie that's twice the size of it. 
So that's kind of the allure of sunfish uh, for people who are sport fishermen. And then those who are catching fish for food, they're a great ample source of, you know, catching large numbers for three, four, five, six months out of the year. And we're just kind of on the cusp of that in most parts of the state. So with all these asking anglers, go ahead and use the chat bar at any time. If you have questions, where to fish, what to use, going through a topic too fast and you have more questions or these are meant to be conversational. So use the chat bar at any time and we'll address questions as we go. So we don't have to go through the whole uh, segment and then you forget what you're going to ask. So, uh, all right. So right off the bat, do they make small offset hooks for weedless setups on jigs? They do. Um, with your sunfish species, the biggest thing, if you are using artificial lures or flies, but mainly artificial lures, flies, hooks tend to be at the back of the bait already, especially the ones that you would use to target sunfish. And then if you're using bait, you're just on a hook. So essentially your hook point is at the end of that bait. When it comes to the artificials, whether it be hard baits or soft plastics, it's really important to get that hook point as close to the back of the bait as possible because sunfish with those small mouths have trouble getting the bait, getting it up over the hook, and then being able to set the hook. So you get bit all day long, slow or medium retrieving artificial plastics, artificial small hard baits. Hard baits are a little bit more productive as far as just hookup because typically you're running a treble hook and it's usually affixed to the back of the bait already. So it puts you in a good spot to be able to get a hookup. But when you use small soft plastic baits, which you're going to get the most value out of it this time of year, just because the bite becomes so prolific that using natural or live bait can become cumbersome just because you're catching fish so rapidly uh, that being able to cast and retrieve an artificial soft plastic or a small hard bait, you're going to get bit the most often with that. Um, so having that hook point towards the back, and we'll talk about that as we go through the baits. So with that, I'm going to start off with um, our hard baits first and our soft plastics. We don't have a lot of boxes to go through. Most of uh, sunfish is going to be, you're looking for baits that are under two inches. So it kind of limits the amount of baits that are out there to be able to throw. So we'll start with the hard baits and again with keeping a hook near the back of the bait good little lures you're looking at in weight size something that's probably you know just depending on what kind of setup you're using whether you're using spin casting equipment or spinning equipment or a cane pole and what you're going to be able to you know move through the water and cast you could go all the way down to like a 164th ounce uh weight if you're using a light action rod, small test, two pound, four pound test. And then you can get all the way up to, you know, maybe an eighth of an ounce on some bigger water for some bigger fish, but typically staying somewhere between like a 132nd, 116th ounce for most anglers is going to be a good happy medium. You're going to be able to cast it without getting the spins or uh, the tangles in the line. You start sizing down to a 132nd, a 164th. You really have to have your rod and your line tailored to be able to cast that equipment, especially on an open face spinning reel, because if you're throwing equipment that is too light for the type of rod and line, uh, you're going to get that line jump where you get those twists that are going to come out. Then you're going to reel them up. And then when you go to throw again, you're going to get that bird's nest that's going to pop off the reel. And then with spin casting equipment, typically you're in a medium action rod, maybe a medium light action rod. And again, you're just not going to be able to throw it with distance. So one sixteenth ounce is usually pretty good. And fortunately, some of the best um, sunfish fishing, like crappie fishing at this time of year, is going to occur underneath a bobber. So that's providing extra weight to your setup when you go to throw it, which will eliminate a lot of that uh, line lash. And you're going to get that out of your soft plastics and your live bait. But if you are going to cast and retrieve hard baits, looking at things like, a super duper, something in gold or silver. These come in a few different sizes. 501 is usually a good happy medium. You can go down to the 500 series, which is going to be the smallest. It's going to be closer to a 132nd ounce. But this is just a small, flashy, bait fish looking lure. So if you're fishing a farm pond throughout the state, city ponds, a lot of them are going to have like golden shiners in there as a bait source. But anything flashy, gold or silver. And these you just tie directly on the little half swivel that they give you at the top. 
And then you just medium slow retrieve these and they just kind of turn like that, give off that nice flash. But we have that real small treble hook, super small, perfect size for sunfish. And it's off the rear of the bait. So when that fish comes and hits it, especially if it gets in behind, like most sunfish species, black bass, crappie, sunfish, they like to attack from behind and from below their ambush predators. So when they're coming up, they gear in, they see that lure coming through the water. They're going to more than likely attack it from behind and from below as opposed to getting it and hitting it like a T-bone. So that's always a good choice is a small super duper. And then are uh, inline spinners like a rooster tail or some other generic non-brand name uh, inline spinner. But chartreuses, oranges, natural colors like brown and olive, these are going to come in those different sizes. If you're buying like a warden's rooster tail, they'll go all the way down to like a 124th ounce which are great, 1 16th ounce, 1 8th ounce are usually going to be a little bit too big of a bait profile and a little too heavy. So usually the 1 16th ounce, this is a 1 24th ounce, this is a 1 16th ounce, but still great bait profile. Anything on your knuckle up to your fingertip, if that's the size of the bait profile, that's perfect. You don't really want to get bigger than that because even the bigger sunfish, the ones that are going to be over a pound or over 10 inch fish, they are still, unless they're hybrid, are going to have a mouth that's about that big. So their mouths, as they grow, doesn't really get a whole lot bigger with them, even when they achieve those greater sizes. So sticking with something like this, rooster tails are super easy. Cast them straight out. Get that blade spinning. If you need to, you just flick your wrist like a little false hook set and you'll feel that blade get going. And then just a slow to medium retrieve, whatever you need to do to keep them up off of the bottom. And so chartreuse, brown, these are going to be great colors. You can also elect for an olive or an orange or even a white or a black. Um, those are going to be just your basic. Keep it natural little bit of flash they're going to see a lot of bait profiles in the water um, that are going to be you know somewhat similar and they're going to predate on their own so anything that kind of looks like a sunfish already you're going to see um, a lot of bites like if you're using a bluegill lure bluegill imitator you'll catch bluegill on those but here's one that's got some chartreuse with that brown body this is a little bit bigger bait profile, but it's still that 1 16th ounce. This is a generic Bass Pro inline spinner. And then here's an olive, something like that. These are great. When you can catch them, when they're up shallow, especially as they move into their spawning beds, if you can throw little hard baits around that you're going to get bit consistently on, you're going to have a lot of good hookup success as far as a cast and retrieve lure goes. Um, your soft plastics, you're going to have to get really in tune with your hook size and your setup. But there's lots of good options for that. So I'm going to start with the bigger end, or we'll go through one more box of hard plastic or hard baits. Real small, one to three foot divers, any basic colors, crawdad, shad, shad. And then small lipless crankbaits, Cotton Cordell, Bill Lewis, um, Stripe King, any brand that's going to make a lipless crankbait in like a 1 8 or a 1 16th ounce size, those are all going to be great. Again, you've got on some of them, you have two treble hooks, but on the other ones that are single, that's on the rear end of the bait. And you're going to get bit a lot with those, especially as they get up into their bedding zones. They're going to get super aggressive. Um, sometimes with like bass, with the bigger fish, you might have to cast at them for a long time when they're up on their beds. Typically, like a crappie or a sunfish, you run anything close to their bedding area, whether they're pre-spawn, in the spawn, or males just guarding the bed post-spawn, uh, you're going to get a lot of activity of fish that are just going to go after it, especially in that real shallow water when you can see them. I mean, you might be able to pull 100, 200 fish off of a bedding zone that's only you know, maybe 50 feet around, 40 feet around, just draw a circle. They're going to look for uh, shallow sheltered water. And I mean, they could be in 
six inches of water. They're just going to get to where they think the bass can't get into them. That's what you're going to see a lot of sunfish are going to spawn later than your black bass species for all intents and purposes, especially in still water like ponds and lakes. Your largemouth bass are typically going to have completed their spawn or be majority through their spawn when those sunfish come into spawn. So those bass are coming out of their spawn. They go and rest for a bit and then they're back into gorge mode. They're ready to replenish from all of the calories and the stress of spawning. They are really going to target in on those sunfish beds. The bigger bass are going to go after the adult fish. The smaller bass are going to be working through trying to get eggs and fry as they're hatching. Um, so those sunfish are pretty much just in attack mode. And that's going to occur from about the middle to later half of this month. Just depending on where you're at in the state, water temperatures are going to play the key role there. We're kind of in that last week where winter is still fighting with us. We'll get a little bit of a cool down after the night. That'll work back up through the weekend. And then the 10-day forecast after that looks really positive. It, that's pretty prototypical good spring weather to really kick off bank fishing for crappie, bass, sunfish, um, we're really going to start to see that as we move into next week statewide. As of right now, the hottest fishing action in the state has been in the south central and the southeastern part of the state. And that's very typical. That's kind of where our fishing starts. And then it works its way kind of in an arch from the southeast, swings all the way up across the northwest. And that's that's where our warm water species are going to go. So middle of March, you're going to start to see that down in the southeastern part of the state. By the time we get to the middle of April, you're typically seeing pretty good fishing statewide, but really from I-40 North, it's middle of April through the end of May. And just depending on where water temperatures are at, that's really going to be when you start to see the best bite action. And for all of our sunfish species, the most important ingredient that we get beyond the light cycle, longer days, warmer uh, water or longer warming periods throughout the course of the day with that later daylight. Uh, but the big thing is, is those overnight lows. And next week, we're really starting to see more of a consistent stri uh, streak of overnight lows that are in at least the mid 50s. And that's what you're really looking for to target any of the sunfish species, which includes largemouth bass, spotted bass, smallmouth bass, black and white crappie. Uh, they really start to get up in those shallow waters where bank anglers can get them. Once you start seeing overnight lows of 55 degrees or higher for multiple days in a row. And after we get through this weekend, it really looks like the 10 day forecast for most of the state is calling for that. So sometime by the middle to late next week, statewide, we should be having some very, very excellent reports um, for a multitude of species for bank anglers statewide. And that's what you're looking for. Uh, Couple of things before we get into the true soft plastics of having to rig them with jig heads. Um, hair jigs, marabou jigs, stuff you would use for crappie, whites, chartreuses, darker colors. I like the crappie magnets if you are going to go with the hair jig just because it's a very small profile. These marabou jigs, even the 32nd ounce, are good size. You know, it's a good size profile. But even the difference between that from where the jig head is to where the hook point is, it's about the same. There's just a lot more tail behind this. And sunfish are notorious for short striking just because of the size of their mouth. So when this is pulsing in the water, they come up behind it. You're getting bit. You're getting bit. You're getting bit. You just never make that hook up on the way in. Whereas something like this, the hair that comes off the back of that really kind of stops less than a half an inch, a quarter of an inch off the back of that hook. So that's smaller if you're going to be using something, really anything that you're going to look to use that's artificial for sunfish, keeping with the hook point as far to the back as possible. But you're going to use essentially whatever you would use to crappie fish, you're going to use to sunfish uh, when you're using artificials. Some other ones that are a little bit bigger profile, but might find you some bigger fish are going to be like pre-molded swim baits that are more in like a two or a two and a quarter inch size profile. Things like this. These are Storm, uh, Wild Eye Shad. These are great, uh, but they get torn up pretty easily. They're internally weighted. 
that hook shank is inside the body and attached to that eyelid. So what will happen is you'll get a bit and a lot of times you'll pull this head down and it'll pop that internally weighted mechanism inside out and that essentially ruins the bait. You won't be able to, uh, to recover from that. But basic colors, bluegill, chartreuse, or some type of just basic minnow shad pattern. Now, let's get into the actual soft plastics that most people will use uh, when it comes to sun fishing with their artificial lures. So the first one that we're going to look at are going to be our baby shad. And baby shad are a brand name from Bobby Garland. And it's just a deep body with a pulsing tail on the back. And these are great. Aside from the fact that you got about this inch long tail off the back. So when you go to put a jig head on, any type of jig head, painted, not painted, swim head, ball head, minnow head, even one with like an underpin flasher, like a roadrunner head, anything's going to work. The key thing is trying to get that bait or that hook point to the back of the bait. So with a baby shad to keep that great action working on the back with that tail. So even when I'm holding still, that tail is just moving. So that's what it does underwater. These are great. You can fish them right below a bobber and just leave them. And it'll just sit in the water and pulse like that. And that's actually with a bait profile of this size, you're probably going to have better hookup success fishing it below a float with sunfish. Just because as you're reeling in and they're trying to grab it from behind, you're going to get bit a lot on that tail and sunfish have those really rough sandpaper mouths, eventually they will do enough damage to the back of this tail that, you know, it could be the first strike, it could be 10 strikes in, but you'll lose that tail. So any type of jig head that you take, the big thing is just trying to pull that hook point out, basically right where the bottom of the bait is turning into the tail. So you put that in mid nose, like we would with almost any soft plastic in a jig head. And you're just going to work that through the body of the bait and pull it out middle of the back. Right where that tail is at. So it still is longer than what we would like because you're going to get short struck, especially if you're retrieving this through the water. But these are going to give you a good blend of fish to catch uh, no matter the body of water, especially at this time of year, April into May, you're going to catch crappie, you're going to catch uh, largemouth bass, and you may get into like temperate species, primarily white bass. If you're fishing a bigger body of water, that's going to have white bass in them. They'll go after uh, your baby shad. Color is not that important when it comes to sunfish. Brightly colored lures, chartreuses, things with some natural tones like a blue or a green or a black. And then our brighter orange for anything that could be in there as far as a prey source goes. Shiners, minnows, other sunfish. Those bright colors are really going to perform well, uh, especially in your clear water where they can really see it. If you're in more stained water, you might elect for something with some good contrast, like a black, uh, just something that gives a really dark shadow if you're pulling it through. Um, reds. Here's another box of some baby shad, but really any of the color scheme, you're going to find consistent bites, especially if you're not fishing a body of water that's super pressured. But in most cases, sunfish from basically right now all the way into the beginning of June are just going to be really aggressive. So they're going to be they're going to be taking strikes at just about anything that you can throw at them. Some other baits, uh, curly tail grubs, little hybrid kind of grub paddle tails. Again, you're going to run into some of the issues that you will with the baby shad, which is having enough tag end off the back of that hook where you're going to get bit all day long and you're going to hook up a lot, but you are not going to get every bite that you get um, the farther that that hook point is. So small grubs in the one and a half inch or two inch profile, but especially curly tail grubs that have a smaller tail on them, 
So something like this where you can really pull that bait out right where the tail meets the body. But we're still looking when this thing's running through the water at about an inch behind. And you would rig this the same way that you would the baby shad. But unlike the baby shad that have the nice top flat where the bait or the hook comes out with grubs, you want that tail side up. So you want your hook point mimicking the tail. And with any like dual colored grub like this, it's got that silver on the front and more of a white on the back. Typically the seam line is going to be right down the middle. So you would just work this bait up probably down between like the second to last and the last uh, body part that's down there. Those little ribs that they have on there, you know, stick out just like that. But again, that that wraps out as you're running it through the water, you're going to get bit all day long on that tail. So your grubs and your swim baits, your baby shad, going to just struggle getting bit all day long. So if you're the type of person who might get easily frustrated with getting bit but not hooking up fish, it's not uh, always small fish. A lot of people think when they're getting bit, it's just little fish that can't get the hook. A lot of times it's big fish. They're coming up behind it. They're just not able to get up over that hook point. Um, same thing goes for bumper tails, paddle tails, mixing in with the grub. So instead of having that curly tail off the back, we have a paddle tail, more like a swim bait. But all the colors in here, let me show that again. These are all really good color schemes. Your purples, your blacks, anything with those chartreuse tails. And then moving into some of the lighter colors like your pinks, more natural colors like the orange the green pumpkin, and then whites and different assortments of oranges and chartreuses. All good natural bait colors. But with these, when you're rigging them, so unlike the uh, curly tail grub, we want to make sure that our paddle tail or our boot tail or is faced straight down. So that little kicker boot, you want them facing down towards the ground. You want your hook point coming up on the top of that. So it's going to catch extra water as it comes through. That jig head on the side up. Now these do not have the seam line where you'd want. Instead, it's on the side of the bait. So you have to go right in the middle. The seam lines are actually down the side of these. And you just pull that out through that back part of the body. But again, got about that inch on the back. But any type of jig head that you use, 16th ounce are going to be preferable, especially when you're fishing in that shallower water. Those fish are going to be in less than four feet. You really want to keep it bottom of the water column to the middle part of the water column. But as they get aggressive and they push up shallow, those fish are going to come all the way up to the surface to, to bite. So... That's the fun thing about sunfish is you can catch them in such an array. You pretty much just tailor your setup to whatever it is that how you like to fish and then where you're fishing. Uh, what makes the most sense? Are you catching fish just to catch and release or are you catching to keep? Those are going to kind of dictate what setup you're going to use because some are going to be just more effective at hooking up um, fish. But it might not be as fun of fishing if you're throwing out a bobber and you're just watching that bobber go under over and over and over again. Uh, if you'd rather just catch and retrieve, mix in some multi-species with it, whether it be a pond, a creek, lake, even a big reservoir, this is just the time of year where you're going to see a lot of multi-species catching, especially if you're using artificial lures. But even with bait, using natural worms, red worms, night crawlers, you're going to see a lot of fish activity in the next couple of months in that shallow water that's accessible from the bank. So... This is where we start to get into the baits that the soft plastic baits that I prefer that, you know, if you want to get bit and hooked up more often, utilizing bait profiles where you can keep that soft plastic, which you get so much great action out of these soft plastics. You get a lot of long term value because they're cheap. Jig heads are cheap. You pair them together. All you need is a pack of tubes or soft plastics that's going to come in something that looks like this for like the 15 or 20 pack and something like this that comes with like a 40 pack of whatever brand that you buy and it's great because you can just throw the jig heads directly in the pack 
put them in your pocket with a pair of clippers and a pair of forceps and you're good to go for the day. So especially at this time of year, you get so much more value out of these soft plastics. So maximizing them to get hooked up and then to not destroy your bait because sunfish un Bass can do it, but bass mouths are so big and same with crappie. They tend not to have the same damaging effect on the body or the tail of your soft plastic that sunfish do. And that's just a biological thing with their mouth. They just don't have the ability to overwhelm the bait. So they end up chomping with the sandpaper all over your bait. So you typically have to change out your soft plastic more often than you would um, a hard bait or, you know, if you're fishing for another species, but full body tubes, something like this, it's not hollow body. So we have to go in through the top and then we have this hollow skirt down at the bottom. So when you pull that skirt up, that's the base of the bait. And so that's where our hook point is going to come out. So that gets us really, really close to the tail end of the bait with these. This is a unisex bait as I call them. So there is no up or down left or right as far as you're just putting the jig head through the top where that hook point comes out. You don't have to worry about seam lines or anything like that. You just want to go all the way down to the bottom of the bait and pull that hook point out through the bottom and then work it up until it's fixed on that collar. And that gets us quite a bit closer to the back of the bait. Now we're only about a half inch off. So still not perfectly ideal, but a lot better. So when you're getting bit and they're pulling on this and they're going to rip these tentacles off over time, but because it's a full body bait, they're going to be able to bite that a bunch and it's going to hold together a lot better than a hollow body bait would. Whereas you're going to lose the tentacles, but you're also going to start to eat away at the body. But these don't come in too many color schemes. These are just little Strike King uh, full body tubes. And I'm not sure what their exact brand name is of the tube. But really good colors are going to be like June bug. They all have chartreuse tails to them. But June bug, maroon, black and red. These can find you some really good lunkers, especially if you're fishing them below a float. Get them down near the bottom. I catch some of the bigger sunfish every year with these full body tubes. I don't get bit as often, but I do catch some of the bigger ones for artificial using something like this. But whites pinks monkey milk something that's more that clear with that black flake you're gonna find fish especially in the clear water with that chartreuse but chartreuse is a great color option like a darker colored like this with that chartreuse this is gonna be bang up in some of that murkier water where you get a really nice contrast in that stained water with the black and then you have the chartreuse flash for them to be able to get in behind so that's what you're looking for with the soft plastic. Just kind of tailoring what the type of water is. Um, when you're in clear water, natural colors, green pumpkins, browns, bases of orange, blue, or purple. And then you can obviously go super bright. You can go white. You can go all chartreuse. You have great vision. So it's really just a matter of are you looking to get those fish when they're in the pre-spawn and may still be keying in on natural prey sources or are you fishing them as they're moving into that spawn or post spawn where they just become ultra aggressive and are willing to give take to just about anything that goes in front of them, um, mainly because they're trying to keep it away from their bedding zone. And because they bed in bulk, so bass are solitary bedders. You might you may find a congregation of beds along a shoreline. They're typically separated out. Crappie kind of the same way but a little bit closer together sunfish they literally build their beds it's just a like a checkerboard of they'll build right next to each other and they do that as protection because with all of them swimming around and guarding their beds provides a little bit more protection to the fry and the eggs when predators are inherently going to come in to take a look nether full body bait that's a great color especially if you're fishing pond small lakes um is gonna be just a little mud bug type looking deal but again with these you get a little bit of the length so we're going back into that one inch but this is a really good color scheme anything that's that green pumpkin red and black flake you're gonna find success with this in all different types of water turbidity whether it be crystal clear or whether it be red dirt um 
this is just a good overall color scheme for all of our species uh, of predatory warm water fish when you're in ponds, creeks, small impoundments. That's the color scheme you're looking for. You'd rig this just like you would the uh, full bodied uh, tubes. But with these, we want our hook point coming out perpendicular to the paddles. So we don't want to come out on the same side. So if you were to run a jig head into this, go right into the middle of the nose of the bait, pull it all the way down through the body until we get all the way down to the end of its face. You can even pull it out the bottom. That's usually enough to get it up over the top of the collar. And then it sits just like that. But our paddles are out like this. So when you're swimming it in or fishing it below a float or vertical presentation with like a cane pole, when these are in the water, they're just always going to be pulsing even without movement. But you still are back to, again, like that inch size profile. So you get bit all the time. It really just comes down to you want to get bit and know that when you do get bit on baits like that and you get the full strike and the take, that it's going to be a bigger fish. It's going to be a, you know, at least probably seven or eight inch fish could be even bigger. They're going to have the ability to get up over that hook point. Doesn't mean you won't catch four or five, six inch fish if they can get a hold of it in the right way and get it into their mouth. But you're more likely to lay in bigger fish with the farther the appendage off the back of the hook point is. So that brings us into our two, what I consider the top artificial soft plastics that you can use when you're sun fishing. And that's going to be your one and a half inch hollow body tube or a very small inch and a half, either boot tail or straight uh, tail swim bait. So baby shad. Now, one of the real good ones that's on the market now is from Bobby Garland. And it's called an itty bitty. This is a real, this is, pretty dynamite right here. It's got a little joint right there for that paddle. And this, when it sits in the water, even if you're not swimming it, so if you had it on a cane pole, if you had it beneath a float, or you wanted to retrieve it back in, you get great tail action. But this tail is kind of unimposing. I mean, it's so small and we want to bring our hook point out. The important thing with these, if you're going to buy a bait of this profile, or if you buy the itty bitties is making sure that you get the now Bobby Garland makes the accompanying jig heads. They're called itty bitty jig heads and they come in a one thirty second and a one sixty fourth ounce. The main thing is the shank. It's not so much the size of the ball head for the weight. It's the hook shank because this is a very small profile body. And what we want to do is we want to bring that hook point out right before the joint. So I don't know if we can see it in this lighting, but there's a crease that's right there. And we want to pull that hook out on the top side of the bait, essentially at the crease, but not in it. We want to be just before it. And these hook shanks are designed perfectly to get your hook point right to that joint. So you just kind of have to work it on carefully because they are a smaller profile bait so you want to make sure that you're lined up through the center of the bait it's not off kilter or anything or it won't sit on there right but that puts that hook point right at that joint and even though we're still off about three quarters of an inch half an inch this thing even with the smaller fish our sunfish they have that vacuum mouth on them so when they go up to get prey and their mouth goes from closed to open instead of it being like a conical shape, like a walleye, sogeye, trout, where they really got to kind of peck on that bait to work it back into their mouth. Those sunfish species, they open up that mouth and it creates a little vortex and essentially just sucks the bait into the back of their gullet. And this size profile is so perfect for that, that even on that little tiny fish, that just is going to slide right in there. So this is a really, really good one right now for uh, sunfish species. It's designed for bigger crappie when those crappie are finicky and you need that smaller bait profile. 
oftentimes anglers think big bait, big fish, which is only true because only big fish can eat a big bait. A small fish just doesn't have the ability to eat that big bait. But most of the time, especially in pressured water or when fish are just finicky for weather or other variables, they will oftentimes be more apt to go, the bigger fish will be more apt to go after the smallest bait profiles just because it's what they see more of in their natural environment. They, they're used to finding bait balls of minnows and shad that are in that one to two inch range. And that's really what they'll key on if they're feeding. Now, when it goes bonanza and they're just, you know, in attack mode, any of these species, they're going after anything. Um, but when we're out of that window, which doesn't last very long each year, they're really going to key back in on these smaller baits. And again, color for the sunfish, not nearly as important as it can be for species like crappie and bass, but your natural color schemes, bluegrass, which is going to be this color. It's going to be that bluer back with that kind of chartreuse underbelly with some flash through it. This is just a dynamite color scheme. Different brands have it di labeled different. Some will call it blue chartreuse, chartreuse blues, bluegrass. Each brand has just a different name for it. But if you find baits that are in this color, you use this for crappie bass, white bass hybrids, um, sunfish. This is going to be arguably your most dynamic, consistent color for catching fish on artificial in Oklahoma is going to be that bluegrass color. From there, hard to beat chartreuses. So either a straight chartreuse or something that's just a little bit lighter, but still has that chartreuse flash. This is going to perform a little bit better in that more stained water or darker water. And this will perform a little bit better in your clearer water where those fish take on more of that vibrance and you got kind of almost the transparent properties of a bait like that. And then dark bodied chartreuse underbellies or going with a kind of an electric color, like an electric chicken, which again, different brands will have uh, different names, but electric chicken is essentially a pink or a pale pink base with that chartreuse underbelly and then a dark with a green or chartreuse underbelly. But pinks, especially light pale pinks perform pretty well because underwater, and even if you've ever held the sunfish up, especially uh, some of your lighter colored, your female fish um, that don't take on that like bright blue and orange of a male uh, bluegill, they're going to have that iridescent shine in them. So if you hold them in the light, kind of like turkey feathers, they'll look like there's some color of like this or it may be even a little bit lighter. But when you turn them, you get a lot of hints of that purple and green, kind of like what gasoline looks like when you get that shine. You get that in those sunfish species, and you get that in a lot of bait species like shad, different types of minnows, shiners. They all have that iridescent property to them. So when you're looking at choosing baits, ones that really stand out are going to be the ones that kind of are a pale pink or a pale blue that have that chartreuse mixed in because it gives off a lot of that natural shine that you just see in the water. So those are good ones. And then our tubes, which I am partial to the green pumpkin with that red and black flake. This is pretty much my go-to creek and pond fishing for anything, whether it be bass, crappie, sunfish. This is just a dynamite color, dynamite so size profile. We're only about a quarter inch off the back of our bait, but it's slender enough back here that like that itty bitty baby shad, it's going to slide right into that sunfish's mouth. These come just like most of your other soft plastics, especially bigger brands, a Bass Pro, a Bobby Garland, a Strike King, um, things that you see a lot of the smaller, a Mr. Twister, any of the brands that make panfish sized lures, they're going to come in more than likely three, four, five dozen different color schemes. But sticking, always having a natural base, especially when you're fishing creeks and ponds, things that are a little bit more tranquil, don't get a lot of activity on the water, keeping it as natural as possible, you're going to get bit more often. It's not to say that you're not going to tear them up when it's good with your bright colors, your straight chartreuse, your straight pink, blacks and pinks. Um, but with these, I like the inst 
inch and a half profile and they're going to come most of the bag some of the colors that are more popular they'll come in the 40 pack which will look like this but most of them are going to come in that 15 pack which is about this size and it's just the crappie max hollow body tube and if you go to a cabela's a bass pro an academy just wherever tubes are sold something that's in that inch and a half profile um, and they're going to come in tons and tons and tons of different color schemes. But if you if you had to choose a few, green pumpkin with black flake, green pumpkin with uh, red and black flake, and then if you wanted to try for more of a like a bright color, a red, a red and chartreuse, a pink, a pink and chartreuse, black and chartreuse, purple and chartreuse. Those are going to be your kind of key colors to dial in. And the thing with those hollow body tubes is that you need an internally weighted jig head. So you can use a ball jig head, but I'll explain kind of where you get your value out of these tubes. If you were to take a straight jig head, so one that's not, doesn't have weight up the shank, just has that collar up top, you can take that bait and you can take the nose of that bait and put that hook point right through the top and run it all the way down through the hollow body and pop it out right on the bottom pull it up above the little bait collar to hold it on there which you kind of have to work them up and over to get that plastic to break onto it the thing with using the ball head or minnow head or whatever where you just have a shank, you don't have any weight on it, is like I've talked about, those sunfish can really do damage to the bait. So what happens is, is when you don't have that weight down the shank of the hook, it's all air in there. So when they are able to pinch that, when they grab onto it, it's really going to tear up your bait quicker than it does when you're on a weighted shank that goes basically down to the turn. So when you were to, if you were to put a bait onto that, you go up through the bottom of the bait and there's pros and cons to both. So with this, you take the eye guide, you put it right in the base of that bait where it's hollow and you just work the bait all the way until you get to the top. And once you're up at the top, you just kind of squeeze where that eye hole is and that eye hole pops right out. But now the difference is when you hold these two tubes, this one, you're not going to do as much damage to the body when you grab onto it. This one, you're going to do a lot of damage because they just have more room to rip and tear on it. Now, that's the con to this one. The con to this one is this will get torn up, especially when fishing is good. You, you might get 10, 15 fish out of one tube. But when they do rip off all the tentacles, which will happen, or they rip the bait so badly that it's falling back over the top of the bait and you just can't get it back on there, you will have to cut off and retie because you don't have the ability to just slide another soft plastic onto this. Whereas with this one, with the head above, anytime where they ruin that soft plastic, you just pull it straight down the hook shank, take it off and put a new one on. So pros and cons to both, but what happens is, is you get into fish with a hollow body on the round or the minnow head with no weight on the shank, you tend to lose these quicker. So it's really just a matter of how many baits do you want to go through, especially when the fishing's really good. But those are the pros and cons of each of those. But pretty hard to beat a tube. I'm a big advocate of tube fishing, especially in the inch and a half size, especially when you're targeting sunfish. You're at, you could be at the biggest reservoir in the state, or you could be at your own quarter acre farm pond or you, somewhere in between. Um, but tubes, especially in a natural color, most prevalent going to be the green pumpkin with kind of a chartreuse tail to the end of it, or the green pumpkin with the red and black flake. So we have this green pumpkin black flake through it, a little bit of a chartreuse. And then we just have the straight green pumpkin with the red and black. These are, it's just hard to beat them. 
because you're getting a lot out of what the prey source is. And that's the key thing. Anytime you're artificial lure or fly fishing is you are essentially trying to match a hatch. You are trying to get them to come after for now, lots of these today are impregnated with salt and scent. So they're not truly just a piece of soft plastic in the water. They have a little bit extra attraction to them, but unlike live bait, which is either moving and is lifelike, uh, or it's producing a ton of scent in the water. When you're using the artificial baits, you want to go for things that those fish are more likely to see within their environment. And when you can multi-species a bait source, which is what a tube can do for you, especially the naturally colored tubes, it could be an insect, it could be a frog, it could be a crayfish, it could be a bait fish. That's really going to up your just bite rate, catch rate, multi-species rate. So tubes are about as good as it gets when it comes to pan fishing or small body of water fishing, creek fishing, pond fishing, and you are targeting sunfish, but you really want to, you know, open up the board to catch a lot of different types of species. If you're using a swim bait, you're imitating a bait fish. So if they're not keyed in on bait fish, they might be eating insects, they might be eating looking surface, they might be looking for crayfish, any number of things, or they might be looking for a bait fish that's a different color. Using a green pumpkin on a tube, you're just going to get so much value out of that. But the itty bitty type baits, little swim baits, those are also going to give you a really good size profile and you're going to get bit just as often. And you are going to find colors in there that are fairly natural, especially like the black and the chartreuse, the bluegrass. Those are going to do a great job of mimicking just about any prey source that's going to be in those bodies of water that you're going after. So when it comes to that, pretty much puts us through all the artificial. So if anybody's got any questions about artificial lure, um, fishing for, uh, Sunfish, go ahead and type them in now. We'll move into kind of your rod and reel setup. We'll talk about some of the better areas in the state. If you want to make a trip to go target some like trophy sunfish, we do have those available um, in the state. But go ahead and ask those and we'll move into the live bait and your rod and reel setup and what you might be looking for there. So with our live bait or with just bait in general, if we're not using an artificial lure, um, you're looking at more than likely a Aberdeen hook, which is going to be a long shanked hook, something that looks like this size six, size eight, maybe size 10, higher, the number goes up, smaller, the hook gets till you hit zero. And then it goes one aught, two aught, three aught. And that's the number with the dash and a zero. And then as we go up from there, then they get bigger that way. Zero is your starting base. That's size zero hook is going to be something around this size, depending on the style of hook. So this is just an octopus hook and these are great for sunfish, but they do have that shorter shank on them. And so the one thing with sunfish having those really small mouths is if they do get a deep take, if it ends up on the roof of their mouth, way in the back, gets them on the tongue patch, maybe even all the way back there by the gullet. The nice thing about the longer shanked hook is that if you're not using you know, anytime you're pan fishing, it's always good to have a pair of forceps instead of pliers, because obviously these pliers way bigger than our forceps when it comes to getting in the fish's mouth. So with these, you can squeeze that right into a sunfish's mouth, grab that hook, turn it, pop it right out. With this, you're probably going to do more damage to the fish. But if you're planning on keeping the fish, not really that big of a deal. You're just trying to rip your hook back out of there. But if you don't have forceps or pliers, these longer shanked hooks give you that opportunity, especially if you've got that fish hooked up closer to the mouth. So you've got about that much hanging out. Then all you got to do is just turn whatever way the hook is facing. So if it's facing upward in the fish's mouth, you can grab it right here. You'd be palming the fish and you just turn it into where it's hooked and it'll pop right out. Vice versa. If it's hooked on the bottom, press it down, get that hook point up and you can just use your finger. You use these smaller shanked hooks, something where that hook point is much closer to the eye hole. Unless it is truly hooked right in the lip, more than likely you're going to have to go digging for that if the fish takes it with some pliers or with forceps. Now with that, when we talk rod and reel, what are you looking to use when you got two sunfish? 
kind of depends on if you're expecting multi-species. If you're fishing in a pond where there's liable to be catfish, bass, crappie aren't really as important because even a two pound crappie doesn't put up the same fight that a half pound sunfish does. You can, it's kind of dealer's choice. You know, are you looking to catch and keep? Are you looking to play the fish? What are you looking to get out of your fishing experience? The lighter the line, the lighter the action, the more the play you're going to get on a fish. Um, but the more likely you are to lose it, especially if it gets into thicker cover, any type of hard structure and you're using light line. So my go-to when I'm pan fishing, whether it be lakes, creeks, or ponds, I like a light action rod with an open face spinning reel, four pound test, usually some type of hybrid copolymer line, like a P, P line. Instead of paying all the money for fluorocarbon, you get fluorocarbon coated, really good abrasion resistance, but four pound test, light action rod. If you don't know what your rod is, either on the front of the rod deck or the back of the rod deck, it's going to have all these numbers listed on it. It's going to give you kind of the lure size range, the uh, line weight, and then it's going to tell you what the power is. And the power on this for the action is light right up here at the front. So we got our power, light, we've got our line class, two to eight pounds, and then we've got our lure weight, which gives us a 16th up to a quarter ounce. Now, a quarter ounce on this seems like a little bit of overkill as far as throwing. It's got a good backbone, but it's really sensitive up at the tip. But this is great for playing fish. Four pound test, you're going to get everything you want out of fish in a small farm pond. So it'll make those six inch fish feel like giants. It'll make 10 inch fish feel like a fish of a lifetime. Um, but if you're looking to catch and keep, no matter what type of water you're fishing on, you probably want to start with like a medium light action rod and probably six pound test. That's going to avoid most breaks on fish that are under 10 inches, under 12 inches. Once you start getting in that 10 to 12 inch range with the sunfish, whether it be a red ear, hybrid or bluegill, that's going to turn a rod, whether it's a medium action rod, light action rod, light, medium light action rod it's going to have a high probability of snapping four pound tests, especially if there's any type of hard structure around. Um, it's just going to run your line into something. And it's going to snap the line that way. Six pound test, medium light action rod. You're going to have a little bit more backbone. Try to get those fish up to the surface, especially if you're planning on keeping them and you don't want to play them for as long. What pan fish will do is sunfish in particular is they they've got the shoulders on them. They have more of a build like a bass, Crappie tend to be a little bit slenderer throughout. The bigger ones will get those shoulders on them, but they still lack kind of the bulldogginess of um, when you get them hooked up, they're less likely to try to dive on you. They're more going to kind of zig, zig and zag, but you can oftentimes get a crappie face straight at you and bring it right back in. Panfish are going to be going horizontal and away from you and down. So it's going to create all of this water resistance when you're reeling them in. So it's going to make an eight inch fish you know, feel like it's a pound and a half fish, especially the lighter action tackle you're using. So anytime you cook up a sunfish, especially when you're bank fishing, you're typically going to be in water. If you're at a big reservoir, water less than eight feet. If you're in a pond, you might be in water less than two feet. So in those instances, you want to get that rod tip up nice and high, real crank fast. Don't allow them to dive on you. And once you get them up to the surface, they'll lay flat on the surface, keep their mouth out of the water, and you can just rip them right across the top. That's the way to go if you're trying to keep them and fill up a bucket. Don't let them dive on you with no matter what type of equipment you're using. But if you're trying to keep them, definitely want to start with like a medium light action rod, six pound test. You're going to have less breaks, less line twists, less anything that's going to go into that. Now you can go all the way up to a medium action, eight pound test. You go down to a light action rod with two pound test, four pound test, really just, you got to suit your own needs, how you like to fish, how you want to play the fish, what you're planning on doing with the fish once you get them. And that's how you're going to tailor it in. But any one of those setups is going to be able to throw most of these lures that we've shown. Um, with the, the smaller, the one thirty second ounce on an eight pound test, medium action rod, you're going to have to have some experience with casting or else, especially with an open face spinning reel, you're going to get some line lash eventually. You're going to just not load that rod tip up enough. That line's going to jump off because that lure is too light. 
And then vice versa, if you're using like a button press spin caster, they're just so light. And typically those um, spin casting rods, especially if you buy a combo at the store, more than likely going to be a medium action rod. And they're typically a little stiffer all the way up through the tip. So when you go to throw those lighter baits, you're not going to have any of the line twists, but you're going to notice that your bait's trying to dive right down in the water. You're just not getting the distance with the cast that you would like. Um, and in those cases, with most of these baits, actually all of these baits that we've shown, you can fish them with the bobber. You throw them out there with the bobber, you know, put, depending on the depth, two feet underneath the bobber, all the way up to like four, six inches below the bobber. And you can just slowly swim that bobber in, just slowly reel it, keep that bobber working across the top. I'm partial to stick bobbers, but with sunfish, because they attack more like a bass or a catfish, they're going to come up and grab the bait and then retreat back to cover or wherever they came from. It's going to submerge a bobber. I mean, even a bigger, medium-sized round bobber, they'll be able to submerge. I like stick bobbers. A lot of the ponds that I fish for sunfish, I typically will get into crappie. Crappie come, they're upward biters, they tend to suspend. And so with the bobber on the stick, if they do come up and hit it and suspend, takes the tension away from the bobber and the bobber will fall flat on the water, indicating me to bite, set that hook. But if I want to reel it in, this will kind of just drag through the water like this. And it just is so minimal resistance that even those smaller fish that grab it will suck it right under, which a lot of times just the tension of the bobber is enough to set the hook. So that's great for newer beginning anglers or kids who might not be paying attention to that bobber. So either way, stick bobber, small to medium size round bobbers or little peg bobbers, all going to be great with sunfish because sunfish more than likely will at least dunk the bobber. But a lot of times they're just going to take it straight underwater. You get a good hook set. You're good to go from there. Um, so with that, with your live bait, you kind of have your two options, fish below a float or fish off the bottom. Usually more effective to fish with the float or fish with vertically cane pole, just dipping a bait straight down. Um, Aberdeen hook, but any small, small to extra small sized bait holding hook. Aberdeens are great because they have that nice long hook. So if you're just, you know, going quick, popping that hook out with your hands, Aberdeen hooks are going to be the way to go because you have something to grab onto. Uh, you can use some smaller, more compact bait holding hooks, ones that have some barbs. I don't know if we can see that very well, but there's some barbs on the back side of this. So if you were to string a piece of worm up, it's going to hold on to that bait. It'll keep it from falling down the shank and congregating down on the bottom. Big thing with sunfish, if you're using um, live bait, more than likely it's going to be a worm night crawler. I prefer red worms that are a little bit smaller and you can, you know, you can get more of it onto a hook night crawler. You're just taking a big piece. The big thing with any worm that you put on and I can do it with a, um, we'll use one of our small soft plastics tails for this. So if this was our worm piece, just our little tail. The big thing with sun fishing, don't give them a lot of tag end. So no matter how you put that worm on, typically with a night crawler or with a red worm, just get it started on one end and then just continue to loop it. So pull it to where the hook turns and then just continue to put that hook point on, working it up the hook shank until you basically have no more of a tail on than that. Now this will work. I mean, you can take old soft plastics that you have, you've used them out, maybe got them lying in a bucket, pockets, tackle box. You can rip the tail, bottom end of the tail off of a grub, a worm, anything, and you can put them on just like that, like you would a live worm. That's going to catch sunfish. Um, it's a great way to catch a bait. If you're catfishing, just dipping that down along like rip wrap, you're going to find fish. But the big thing is, is keeping that tag in. Um, the more, <coughs> the more uh, tag you have down on the bottom, just the way their mouths are bit, they're going to peck and they're going to pull it off. And then they're going to have more tag end and they're going to peck and they're going to pull it off. And eventually they're just going to clean you. So 
less tag end down at the bottom forces the fish to come up over the hook when they do grab it, fishing below a float, more than likely just it going under and you lifting your rod is more than enough to get a hook set, especially uh, all the hooks you're going to be using when you are fishing for sunfish are going to be small little thin wire hooks. They're super sharp. They go right in. You won't have any problems with that. Now, the other way that you can fish for them. So whether, and one thing that I will mention that I do personally, because I don't like carrying around a cup of worms, you end up leaving them in a bag, backpack, truck. They get nasty once they're left in the heat for an hour. They're just going to be rank. So, and they get all over your hands and wipe them off before you know it. The side of your pant leg, if you're not using a towel, is just trash. So crappie nibbles, little pellets, really anything, crappie fireballs, anything that's labeled as just these little tiny uh, either paste or soft plastic, scent impregnated, bright colored, are great. These keep, so you can leave these in your truck. You can leave them in a bag. You seal them up with the lid just like you would paste power bait for trout. And these are going to last you a long time, not to mention, unlike worms that you'll go through very quickly, there's hundreds of these crappie nibbles in here. So each one results in a fish and it's perfect because it sits on the hook just like that, forces the fish up and over, almost guarantees that you catch the fish every single time. So crappie nibbles, especially if you're fishing small bodies of water, like a pond neighborhood pond, city pond, farm pond, go-to of choice. If you're looking to catch total numbers, maybe you're new, maybe you've got kids, either or, or you just like catching a ton of fish and keeping it quick and simple. Put these in your pocket, you can keep the lid off because the bite's going to be so fast and furious. Put that on, we'll tie it on. So take our tube off here. And then you're just going to tie your hook on however you like. Panfish, I'm not usually overly worried about my knot as much. So if the eye hole is big enough and I can double over the line and do a Palomar knot, that's what I'm going to do just because I can do it a little bit quicker than I can an improved clinch or a trialing knot. And if you break off, it's easy to just get yourself going. So get that on we'll cut our tag end off so get your hook secured however you like it whatever type of knot that you tie just don't tie an overhand square knot because that'll break every single time then we want a piece of split shot and this is just to get it down so that our bobber floats well so just a really tiny piece of split shot anywhere above the hook point you know a couple inches when the sunfish are biting good you will get bit on the weight occasionally your bobber will go under because they grab the piece of split shot instead of the bait. doesn't happen all the time, but it will happen. And then whatever type of bobber you want. So when they're up on their beds, you probably don't need to be more than a foot. Also, why I like stick bobbers, super easy to get on. You use the peg bobbers or a round bobber. Not only do you have the top clip, but you got the bottom clip. And that's all that it takes. And that with the crappie nibbles, this is this is my go-to if I'm fishing a pond, especially if I'm keeping fish and I want to fill up a bucket. I just can't catch fish any faster and more effective than I can with this. But that's going to be your basic setup. So if you're fishing in the deeper water, a bigger reservoir where maybe you're fishing out in like four feet of water, you're just going to move your bobber up to a couple of feet. Those, unlike crappie that may not come out of a certain depth, they may, you know, they may be willing to give or take a foot or two, but if you're five feet up above them, they may not be willing to come up. Sunfish with that scent in sight, they're much more likely to come nearer to the surface to get your bait. So you don't need to get it under depth, slip corking, unless you're fishing for them in the winter, not usually necessary. You can use a fixed bobber or a cane pole and just dip it out there. In clear water, even in stained water, typically the shorelines are going to be you know, you're going to have some visibility into the water and you're just looking for beds that are about saucer plate. And you're going to see these little circle depressions and they're going to be grouped together like a connect four board. 
um, or a checkerboard. They're going to be right next to each other in usually on a flat inside of a cove, a marina. They like the inside turns of points. So whatever is the protected side, like let's say, especially um, when they spawn, if you have a point that's going out either straight west or straight east, they're going to be on that north side. So if the south side, that wind is driving into the outside of the point, when you go around the point, all of that water is protected from those waves and from other bait fish getting pushed in and bringing in those predator fish. So they're going to get out. They're going to find that sheltered water. So anywhere where you can find sheltered water come the middle of April, end of April, into May, that's where you're going to find bedding areas for sunfish. It's usually typically the backs of coves. If you're on a pond, it's just going to be anywhere where they can come up on a shelf in one to two feet of water but again, anywhere where there's wind protection on a point, that backside of the point that will form a little bowl, that's going to be good bedding area. But you're more than likely going to be able to see the bedding area, even when you're on a big reservoir. You get in the backs of those coves, you're going to see all those beds. Um, but bobber, piece of split shot, small hook, either a worm, crappie nibble, some other type of dough or soft plastic type bait that has scent and all that. That's going to be your quickest, easiest way to catch a ton of fish. Now, if you're looking to target fish on the bigger reservoirs, especially if you're in like a marina, state park, casting out to the middle of a cove, what those sunfish will do is they're not going to travel great distances like bass will. They won't go to the lake. They're going to move out to maybe the mouth of a cove, mouth, um, get out in water that's 10, 12, maybe 15 feet deep. And that's going to be the bigger fish. And they're going to look for root wads, brush piles, spider blocks, anything that they can just sit down. In. Now, as we move out of the winter into the spring, they're going to start looking for grass flats. Anything that they can just kind of suck into that's got good cover because sunfish are the primary forage of largemouth bass and flathead catfish. Two voracious predators that will feed up shallow it's going to spook those fish all around. So they're always looking for real thick, especially vegetated cover where they can just kind of sit down in it, look up above most fish, their eyes kind of sit higher up on their head. So they're sitting there looking for prey. They'll sit in those weed lines, grass lines, underneath logs, any type of big brush. And then they're just coming up for bait, which is perfect because you're just running your bait right over the tops of those. Um, but most of the time you're going to be able to access them from the bank. You're going to be fishing within 10 feet of the bank is where you're going to be catching those sunfish. Sometimes you're catching them a foot or two in front of you. Rip wrap areas where there's boulders, places that they can suck back into the crevices where the rocks are that bass and catfish can't get in to get them. That's where, I mean, even bigger sunfish are going to be able to fit down into those crevices. Whereas bass start to build out like this, they can't get in there, but even your big sunfish are still going to keep more of a narrow body structure. They can slide into those cracks and crevices pretty easily. But every now and then, and just depending on the time of year, right now when we're in the pre-spawn, if you're on the bigger lakes and reservoirs, marinas, state parks, areas that are built in kind of the sheltered water that you're looking for for the spawn they're going to be out in a little bit deeper water and they're probably going to be right down on the bottom mixed in with all the sticks and any debris that's down there where they can hide and in those cases you're just using a basic bottom bouncing approach just like you would if you're fishing for catfish or non-game species up off the bottom and you can use a aberdeen hook like this i don't uh i'll go away from that when i know that i'm more likely to get into other species, particularly big non-game species, drum, carp, buffalo, um, and then a bass might pick it up, a catfish might pick it up. So I elect for uh, more of a thick wire hook, like an octopus hook, something that's like this, still similar in uh, size structure to the hook turn. So not much of a difference in that, because that's what you're looking for on a fish. They need to be able to take this hole from the turn to the tip, they need to be able to get that in their mouth. So the wider that gap becomes on these hooks, this is about as big as you want, even for big sunfish to be able to 
with the mouth that, you know, maybe gets up to about that, where that can slip right in. You start getting into the size one aught, two aught, you know, even sometimes depending on the hook, make and model, a zero or a one or a two might be a little bit too big. You start getting into the size sixes, size eights, that, that's going to be big size range all the way up to 10 or small you want to get. Now with that, you can tie them onto a swivel like this, give yourself a little bit of a leader line foot to 18 inches. And then on the main line of uh, your rod, you can just take a weight, either like a casting weight. So casting weight is going to be this dumbbell shaped weight, got a big, nice eye hole on it. Some type of bottom bouncing weight, like a Lindy rig weight. And either way, if you're going to use something like this, make sure you're going through on the side where it kicks back because these are meant to be drug along the bottom. So anytime you see a weight where it comes down and it kind of turns into like a little bit of a boot, you want that flat side being on the bottom faced up your line when you have to retrieve it in. Or you can even slow roll them uh, just depending on how much debris is in the water. You can do a really slow retrieve with a worm and that'll get fish. You know, if you're not casting right on top, of where those fish are, you can drag it into the habitat where they're at. And then on our leader line, and then we just tie onto this end of the swivel. This comes back onto our swivel, you cast that out, and that fish is right up off the bottom. Now, if you don't wanna use a swivel, you just wanna tie your hook directly onto your main line, you can do that as well. You can slide your weight on either before or after you put the hook, cause these have big enough eye holes where you can actually slide that over the hook point, up the hook shank, and then onto your line. And then you can just secure it at however long you want your leader line to be with a piece of split shot instead of the swivel. Either way, it allows your line to, your weight to be free on the line. And the big thing with that is anytime fish are biting, they don't care about the hook. So them munching down, feeling that hook point, it doesn't do anything to deter them. They eat stuff all day long that's got pinchers, that's got barbs, spikes, anything like that, that can get them in the mouth. What they hate is tension. So when a fish really starts to fight you, it's when it realizes that there's something pulling against it and that's what freaks them out. So what we want when we're bait fishing, really when we're bait fishing for anything except for like a catfish that they're just so aggressive that they pick up a bait and they just go. Um, but for the most part, fish with smaller mouths on them that kind of have to peck at the bait, get it in the back and swallow it. By having either a swivel or a piece of split shot, as opposed to fixing this weight on a, like a fixed position, either with bobber stops um, or with, let's say you put a snap swivel on and attached it to the snap swivel. What happens is, is when this is sitting on the bottom like this and the fish goes to bite it, it pulls the line through the weight. So that you get the quintessential bite action on the tip of your rod to indicate that bite. If you're not using some other type of bell or sensor to a, a bite alarm. So when they're biting, you get that nice tap, 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 but they're not feeling the line. They're taking that bait and that weight is just free. So you see it on the line, but they're not feeling that tension gives you that extra half second or so to be able to pick your rod up out of the rod holder. If you're holding it in your hand, propped up against lawn chair, cooler, set the hook, you're good to go. So anytime that you're bottom fishing, it's always important that you're securing your weight so that it's free on the main line, because that's what really will detract you from those bites, especially on finicky fish. Um, walleye, sogeye, trout, things that really have to work to get that bait into the back of their mouth. If they're really feeling tension, same thing with sunfish. They're so small, peck, peck, peck. They're not getting it. They're not getting it. They may eventually give up if they feel like, you know, there's tension there, but they're not going to get because of the bait or because of feeling that hook. So that's just something to think about when you're out there that a lot of times people secure that weight to their line somehow and they'll get bit, they'll get the thump or even a thump thump. But by the time they go to grab their rod to set the hook, that fish is given up on it because it's sensed that tension and knows that something's up and they just go ahead and leave it alone. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as baits are concerned for sun fishing. Now with like fly angling and things like that, you can go with uh, just a strike indicator, something like that. 
you trout magnet work great. Little tiny 164th ounce jig heads, 196th ounce jig heads um, come with these little, they're called trout magnet and they come with different types of soft plastics, but these are basically inchworms, really good size profile. You can double rig them and throw them, throw this really nice and smooth on a fly rod. You can throw pheasant tail nymphs, prince nymphs, um, really anything that's just small and flashy. Copper Johns, Bloody Marys, lightning bugs, pheasant tails, prince nymphs, nothing fancy, stuff that you can get at any big box retailer, which in Oklahoma, we're lacking in true fly shops. There's a new one here in Oklahoma City that replaced Backwoods, which was there several years ago. So we have that back on uh, May and 122nd in Oklahoma City. And then you've got Beaver's Bend Fly Shop uh, down at Broken Bow. But aside from that, you're dealing with Bass Pro, Cabela's, you go into a big box. They're going to have all of those basic types of uh, nymph rigs. You can also catch them on small woolly buggers if you want to strip a fly. You can also strip those little nymph flies in or fish them below a float. Um, as you get later into the summer months, late May, early June, fish have gone through their spawning cycle. They're usually tucked up close to cover. So in the mornings and the evenings, like all the sunfish species, except for crappie, which are more middle of the day, move up to the cover, your bass and your sunfish are going to be super shallow in those early morning hours. And then again, in the late evening hours. And then as the day wears on, you get to the heat of the sun, gets really hot out. Water temperatures are starting to get up into the high seventies, eighties, high eighties. They're going to seek shade. So good places to target sunfish are going to be underneath overhanging uh, limbs. So anytime where you have big cottonwoods, any type of riparian zone trees that are going to provide a lot of good shade in kind of mixed bottom, especially where they can move quickly from really shallow water out to, you know, relative deep. So in a big lake that might be going from two to 14 feet of water in a pond, it might be going from one to six feet, but just somewhere with that shade, more cover, more structure, more shade, more overhanging cover, the better that's going to congregate more fish. But as you get into that time of year, fly anglers, you can throw uh, stimulators, small, like size 14 little stimulators, ant patterns, hopper patterns. You'll get a lot of top water action with sunfish and that can be really fun. Um, same thing goes for uh, traditional tackle anglers. You can throw real small poppers, um, rebel baits. They make a couple of different like uh, their little cricket hopper that splashes across. That's really good top water for panfish. Um, but that's pretty much it. So we'll talk about some of our better lakes to go to. We got about a half an hour left at any point. Throw a question in there if you got any questions. But that brings us through pan fishing is super easy. I mean, this is the time of year. If you just love to catch fish, it's awesome to go out to ponds, creeks, even the big lakes you can get on get in on like really prolific bite days. I consider going to a reservoir, like a major reservoir or a big lake in Arcadia, a Hefner, if you're here in town, um, anywhere else around the state, all the way up to our monster reservoirs, Texoma, you fall a grand, um, everywhere in between those bigger ones, you know, a good bank angling day for somebody on that sands, the sunfish spawn sands, the crappie spawn where, you might have those triple digit fish days, a good day out on the lake, especially a big reservoir when you're fishing from the bank. You no, know, it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 20 fish. Like that's a pretty good day of fishing from the bank, regardless of the species. If you get on multi-species really can make for a good trip. Um, so setting those expectations, but you fish the smaller bodies of water, you go to your city lake, your city pond, if you have a pond in your neighborhood, pond in your backyard, family members got, you know, farm pond somewhere. That's really where you're going to be able to go have those triple digit fish days for a couple hours of fishing for a solid six to eight weeks um, with a mix of crappie, bass, channel catfish, sunfish, um, fishing from the bank. So for sunfish, doesn't get a lot easier and they provide a better bite than crappie do. Um, you clean them, clean them the same way as you do crappie. They're good as well. Um, meat's going to be a little bit on the 
just to have a little bit darker tinge to it, but it's not red meat. It's still going to be that white meat. It's just going to look a little bit different than your crappie filet. But the difference between catching eight inch crappie and filleting them versus catching eight inch sunfish and filleting them, you're going to get a lot more meat off of the eight inch sunfish than you are off of that eight inch crappie. Um, so really anytime you're getting in that eight to 10 inch size class for sunfish, which is a good sunfish, that's going to average somewhere between a half a pound three quarters of a pound. Once you start getting over 10 inches to 12, you might start seeing fish in that pound to pound and a half range. And I mean, that's, that's a fish that, you know, you have trouble grabbing it on the back and on the bottom. Fish handling tip. When you grab those sunfish, the easiest way to handle them, unless it's just so big that you can't get your hand around it is lay them down in whatever hand you plan on holding them with, with the dorsal fins, um, faced up towards you so the fish is lying flat and if this was its back that way you can take your thumb so lay the fish's head in between your thumb and your index finger with the dorsal fins faced up your arm and then you can take your thumb and lay down those dorsal fins and clasp it that way those spikes don't get you because if you go and grab one of those sunfish with those uh, dorsal fins up and you haven't done it before you're not going to do it again um, it'll spike you pretty good. Now, unlike catfish that have a little bit of poison in those spikes that will linger, it'll sting real bad when it gets you, but it also linger for a day or two. Um, those sunfish will just, it's like grabbing a briar, getting stung or getting hit by something, getting stung by a mosquito. You know, it's going to hurt initially and then it'll kind of subside, but you definitely don't want to go grabbing them. So when you can lay that thumb and just pull the spine down and get a good hold of them, then either using pliers or your finger, you're going to be able to get that hook out of the fish's mouth as quickly as possible to either throw it into your basket or bucket to take it home and clean it, or you're going to be able to throw it right back in the water. If you do plan on catching and releasing fish, um, you may wet your hand, whatever hand it is that you hold the fish with. Get your hand wet once. You're usually catching fish so quickly that you don't need to do it for every fish, but that'll help if you have a dry hand and you put the fish, any type of fish, and you palm them as opposed to lipping them, which is very difficult unless it's a green sunfish or a bigger hybrid sunfish. Um, you're going to take that uh, slime that they have on them, and all that is is a protective coating that helps them stave off bacteria that can cause infections to them and ultimately kill them. When you grab them with the dry palm, slap takes that slime off, they may go back into the water and develop an infection because bacteria was able to grow on them. That slime is their protective layer um, from disease and virus and bacteria that can get on them. So just a fish handling tip on that. So let's talk about where you're looking to sunfish. So in the state, Oklahoma, we have a couple of designated what we consider to be trophy sunfish areas. They're bookended on either end of the state. There's plenty few and far between. Um, lots of different reservoirs will produce, you know, good sized fish. Lots of farm ponds will produce really good sized fish. But we have a lake on the eastern half of the state and a lake on the western half of the state that are truly designated or designed to be trophy sunfish fisheries. On the eastern half of the state, that's going to be Spiro Lake. And that is going to be eastern half of the state, South I-40, almost to the Arkansas border. And there are two lakes over there, Spiro number one and two. They have the old lakes and they've redone them. But those are trophy sunfish lakes to keep in mind. So if you live anywhere where you want to go make a trip to go target sunfish towards the end of this month, middle of this month, go after some truly trophy class fish, fish that are in that 12 plus inch range, which they don't get much bigger than 12 inches. I mean, you get up to 14 inches, you're looking at starting to get into that state record class size, but definitely a lot of fish that are over 10 inches. Um, and then on the Western half of the state, just North of I-40 is going to be uh, American horse. And that is a lake that the department actually owns and manages. We drained it several years back. It's been up and running now for six, seven years. It's been a while now. Um, but we designed it to be a trophy sunfish fishery. So you basically are bookended either end of I-40. So you live in Oklahoma City, American Horse is going to be closer. Um, Spyro is going to be a good solid two and a half, maybe a little bit longer drive. American Horse from the city is going to be hour 15, hour 20. Um, and that's just going to be just north, 
Cherokee Trading Post right there off of, I think that's like exit 108, 104, going westbound on I-40. Um, and those are our two trophy lakes. But like I said, sunfish exist in every body of water all over the state. You're going to find them in different numbers. You're going to find them in different species. If you're creek fishing during the summer, like a Blue River, any of the public access, Illinois River, Barron Fork, Mountain Fork, Glover, Little River, Little uh, Lee Creek, anywhere we can just get on and fish, you're going to find all sorts of sunfish, but you're going to see a lot of long ear sunfish, which are the real pretty vibrant tur uh, turquoise colored face masking with the real bright orange underbellies. That orange fades up into their bodies. They look real cool underwater and they look even cooler when you get them out of the water. You see a lot of those in the clear creeks on the eastern half of the state. And you will catch some of those that are eater size um, getting over that you know, six inches is kind of about as small as you want to clean them unless you're just spoon scaling them and cooking them whole. Otherwise, if you want to truly boneless fillet them, you're probably wanting to at least start with probably eight inch fish before you start going that route. That'll give you a chunk of fish that's about that big. You know, you catch 40, 50 fish in a day, clean all them. You fill up a quart bag of perfect little strips that are great for fish fries, or you can throw them into a pan or a skillet. Uh, grill them up or pan sear them however you like them use them for taco meat and the, either way great food source um, from the sunfish but as we're moving in to the you know where we are right now unless you're in the far southeastern part of the state where water temperatures are a little bit warmer um, where you're going to start to see those fish congregating up a little bit shallower especially as we get into next week big key with the sunfish species in the state water temperatures above 55 degrees um overnight so water temps are coming up right now across the state they're averaging anywhere from the low 50s in the northern half of the state to the low 60s in the southern half of the state sunfish are really going to come to life once water temperatures are above 60 degrees really kind of in that 65 to 75 degree range is when they really are most active pushing into their spawning habitat so you're going to get the pre-spawn. You're going to get these fish and those bigger fish will usually start to come up first, get near that transition habitat. So anywhere where you can find in the backs of coves, um, if you're fishing ponds, those kind of shallow bays that come back in, anywhere where there's drop-offs, ledges, creek channels with lots of good structure, either visible laydowns that you can see or, you know, you kind of have a lay of the land and you know where there's drops that's where you're going to see those bigger fish sucking up right now. As those water temperatures get warmer, they're going to start pushing up during the daytime. They'll move into those shallow bays. Some of them may even start to, you know, build their beds, but they're going to be feeding actively because what it does is it starts to get these insects in mode. They, you know, feed a lot on insects and those hatches are going to start occurring as those water temperatures start to get into the sixties. See a lot of mayflies and caddis, um, popping on different types of water and they're going to key in on that. We're going to start seeing the terrestrials, small frogs. They'll, they'll hammer those small frogs, crayfish, crayfish have come out of their spawning season. So you're, they're going to be more active. You're going to have crawfish hatches. So you're going to have little baby crawfish out there. They're really going to look for that as their primary food source. And then whatever bait fish are in and around, but those bait fish are going to start to seek the shelter of the warmer water. They've been out deeper water, colder water, very lethargic. As we come out of that, all these different fish species start to pop all at the same time. Right now, it's all about the temperate bass, your stripers, your hybrids, your white bass. They go first along with your saw guy and your walleye where they really push up shallow, go through those spawning cycles, run up the creeks, run up the rivers, anywhere where there's inflowing water. Then we see the crappie come behind them. Then the crappie do their thing. Largemouth bass follow right in behind them. And then behind the bass, we get the sunfish species and the shad and other minnow species will come in to do their spawning. So it's just this constant influx of rotating fish species that are moving into these easily accessible bank access fishing on any body of water, whether it be creeks, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, or ponds. Um, but you're really looking to target bulk number, catching the most amount of fish is locating areas within those public access areas, or if you have access to private land where you can get on looking for that sheltered, protected water, big lakes and reservoirs going to be back of Creek arms, backs of coves, marinas, um, any natural made structures that might be 
you know, mini marinas, mini water breaks, um, inlets, anything that's been kind of dredged out, canals, channels, backwater, if you can get in where water pushes underneath the bridge through culverts and goes back into like backwater area, those are going to be the areas where those fish are going to look to spawn. And that's where you're going to find them in bulk. That's where you'll find the most numbers of them. If you're looking to target those bigger fish right now, before they fully push up, because it's a pretty quick turnaround with all spawning species. There's really on any given body of water, a one to maybe two week window where it's just lights out for that species every day. Then you, you know, you get the build up into it and then you get the taper off out of it. Um, but with those sunfish more prolonged, you're going to, because they're a shallow water fish, as we move into the warmer days, they stay up a lot longer. Your bass, they're going to hang out, you know, in that shallow cover and structure, and they're going to be looking for bait fish. Crappie are going to push back out in the overnight hours, work their way towards shallow cover during the daytime when they're free of the nocturnal predators like catfish, bass, saga, and walleye that will predate heavily on them. Um, but those sunfish more often than not are the one species in the state that will stay once they push up out of that pre-spawn. They're going to stay in that shallow water for the most part all the way through October. So you have the most opportunity at that fish species for the longest period of fishing time and the longest course of the day. So from the morning all the way into the evening, you're going to be able to find sunfish throughout the day. Whereas we get a little bit hotter, get into those dog days of summer, all of a sudden bass, crappie become a little bit tougher to catch throughout the course of the day. You're going to see better bite activity mornings, evenings. Um, or if you're out on a boat when you, or out on big docks or piers where you can access that deeper water where they're looking for shade, cover, better water temperatures. Um, those sunfish are a little bit more hardy. They're going to stay up in that really warm water and you can get after them in that. So that's really what you're looking for. Um, we still got 20 minutes left, but that kind of brings me through everything uh, on sunfish cleaning tips for them. Uh, you can get a little board, you know, easiest way to do it on the run. If you're not going to use a manual knife, always great investment to get like a plug-in electric fillet knife, especially something you can plug into your vehicle. That way you can clean the fish right there at the water quickly. Um, unless you're just really skilled with fish cleaning with a manual knife, it's a lot easier to use an electric fillet knife, especially with those smaller fish. You can cut right down to the backbone, clean them off, flip that over, and then get that as much meat off as you can the quickest. With a manual knife, you're probably going to salvage a little bit more meat um, just because you are fine tuning it with your hand, whereas an electric blade is going to be running. So you have to keep a steady hand. You're more apt to maybe go through the backbone. You lose one half of a fillet occasionally, but just a bucket or a basket. I like a bucket unless it's just super hot outside, which we really don't have to worry about probably for another, at least a month. You know, once you start getting daytime highs where you're in the nineties, high eighties, no cover, no shade, you know, you fill up a bucket of water, maybe throw some ice in it. Um, or those fish will start to, you know, get pretty soft sitting in that bucket you always put them in a cooler where it's covered, or you can throw them in a basket and throw them back in the water. But depending on where you're fishing at, you're going to attract a lot of turtles, uh, doing that. And what ends up happening is you start catching those turtles. You start congregating turtles, especially in like a pond or a small city lake around where you're fishing for sunfish. They're going to dive down, especially if you're using bait, if you're using crappie nibbles, um, any type of doe bait, uh, pellets, worm, leech, even a minnow, they're going to go down and they're going to find that. They start to key in on the bobber. So if you're fishing with the float, those turtles will key in on the bobber and they'll dive down on the bobber. So that's why I like to use a bucket, keep the fish up out of the water. But if you're going to be fishing heat of the day, no shade, maybe throw a half a bag of ice at the bottom of your bucket, then fill it up with the water and then put your fish in that. Get yourself a little fillet board. Um, doesn't have to be anything fancy, just something that's at least 12, 14 inches long, that big. They sell them at, you know, most outdoor retailers where you can either get a little uh, fiberglass board or a little wooden board. Um, some of them come with the clamp where you can clamp the tail on and help you get the flay off easier. 
and then an electric fillet knife that plugs right into your cigarette lighter. You can run it out the window. You're right there at the water. You've got your bucket. You dump all those fish out onto like the bed of your truck, clean them, throw all the guts back into your bucket, take it down to the water, easy, clean, Ziploc bag and a small ice chest. Or if you're not traveling very far, just the AC on your in on your car is enough. And that's going to help you with cleaning them and catching as many as you can uh, if you haven't done it before. If you've been doing it for a while, you probably have your own style, your own setup of how you do it. But if you haven't, that's that's going to be your quickest route to do it is electric fillet knife that plugs in. going to help you clean them the best. Um, and you can YouTube how to clean sunfish and you're going to see a million different videos of all good information, different ways to clean with different types of blades, how to scale them if you wanted to keep the whole fillet and just spoon scale them. Uh, they make scaling machines now. You can just run a panfish through the machine and it does it. Um, lots of different options out there today, but it is that fun time of year where finally it looks like we're just in that last little bout with winter next couple of days to bring us back down into the 50s, low 60s for daytime highs, high 30s, low 40s for overnight lows. But once we get to this weekend, the, the extended forecast looks like we're getting right into that wheelhouse puts us right in the middle of April, which is typically in Oklahoma statewide when the best fishing occurs. Second week of April through the end of April for a multitude of species is typically the window to go. So if you don't have a lot of time to go, you get to pick a weekend a year, an evening a year, and you're just, you know, what's my best shot to go out and catch fish when I go? If you are in Oklahoma, it is middle of, it's, Middle of April, you know, April 10th to April 15th through April 30th. That's, I mean, that that two weeks is almost assuredly without catastrophic flooding going to be the best window for bank fishing to catch the most amount of fish, the biggest fish, and the most different types of species of fish while targeting one species. That's the, that's the window that it's going to occur. And it's always April, you know, southeastern part of the state, southern part of the state kind of kicks that off end of March, early April, especially if they've had some rainfall like they have this year. And we've had those warmer daytime highs, but still even the lows in the Southern part of the state have not stayed a whole lot higher than they are in the rest of the state. So this year, I think without, and we don't really have any major rain in the forecast aside from the far Eastern half of the state. So 80% of the state is going to come to life for fishing. So pretty much no matter where you live, um, in the state this year, you're going to see the best fishing reports kind of come into life in the next 10 days. And it'll run for two, three weeks, just depending on the body of water. And, and that'll be it. You know, after that starts to get a little bit tougher, especially on those bigger bodies of water when you're fishing for the bank, you know, you'll have that good day and you'll have that real bad day. Um, so maximizing your opportunity to catch the most amount of fish, the biggest fish, um, the most species of fish we're coming into that window right now. Um, so if you can, if you can get out there, you know, now's the time to do it starting this weekend, but probably more next weekend will be the real kickoff that you'll see on our, if you follow our fishing report um, from the lakes across each region, you're probably going to see all of those fishing reports next weekend, all kind of turn from slow to fair, maybe even good to great excellent you know good to excellent will be the range starting in about next week um, so if you ever have any questions if you got the email for me today you've got my contact email text call we'll hook you up uh i'll either answer the question for you or get you pointed to the person who can answer it better than i can um all these asking anglers are just meant to maximize the little bit of time that you may get on the water you know we appreciate y'all being out there um and we want you to be able to maximize your efforts, tailor your fishing setup to how you like to fish. That's a great thing about the outdoors, fishing and hunting. There's no right way to do it. You get to kind of mold your own path of what you like to fish for, how you like to fish, where you like to fish, when you like to fish. You know, there's not too many hobbies out there where you can really tailor everything to you. Um, so I always like to end these with just saying thank you. We can't do these without you. Uh, we are a non-appropriated state agency, meaning we receive no state tax dollars. We are funded completely uh, by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and donations. And with that money, we're able to maximize those dollars 
with federal grant funds, which come from excise taxes that are spent on hunting, fishing, uh, ammo guns, marine fuel. There's an excise tax that gets taken off of that. So anytime that you buy fishing equipment, small excise tax gets taken out of that, goes into a big federal pot to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And then based on your state size and the amount of license holders um, per population, allocates how much money can then be transferred back to the state which we have to match 25%. So if we were doing a project that was $100,000, we would need to come up with $25,000. That $25,000 comes directly from license sales. So we are very much a model for North American conservation where it's user pay, user benefit. So when you buy hunting and fishing equipment, when you buy fishing licenses, all of that money goes right back into management, to fish stockings, to boat ramps, to docks, um, habitat improvement, food plots, roads, uh, anything that you can think of that goes back in that is funded 100% by you guys. Um, and then we're able to take that and get that federal match for 75%, which gives us, you know, 75% more money to then double down to put into these projects. So thank you for that. Um, that's what's going to continue hunting and fishing in North America as populations continue to grow as urbanization occurs in more rural areas in order to protect the hunting and fishing that we grew up with, that we love, that we can hopefully enhance and grow with and conserve and kind of right some of the wrongs that have been made over the years as far as invasives and any which way that comes into conservation. You know, it's a group effort. It's not just state agencies. It's not just federal agencies. In the United States, it is just as important for those who actually participate to be involved, to have your input, to have your license dollars go directly back into the sport, as opposed to if we were an appropriated agency, if you bought fishing and license, um, fishing and hunting licenses, that money could actually be taken from us by the state to then be used elsewhere. So every dollar that you spend um, in hunting and fishing in Oklahoma goes directly back into the sport and into the resource. So we appreciate that. Uh, anything that we can do to help, please reach out. With that, tight lines, weather's looking pretty good. So get out there and fish. And if I can ever be of any assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'll get you pointed in the right direction. So thanks. Have a good day. And we'll see you next time.